and said, you know, it might be just kind of good to find a different voice. And so I asked Tiffany if she happened to know somebody that, uh, that knew anything like that, knew anybody that fit into the category of kind of the Western Sunday and that could speak to, to that. And she said, you know, I've got a, an uncle. His name's Nathan Darst. And uh, he's kind of heading up the cowboy church and, and kind of uh, has opportunities to, to speak to, to folk like that. And so maybe he had fit that role. So we called him and he said that he would be available. And so uh, make welcome Mr. Nathan Darst. I can talk pretty loud without it, so we'll probably be okay no matter what. And uh, thank you very much, Pastor, for allowing me to be here, and I'm going to do my best to stay here. This is kind of caging me up a little bit. It's all right. We're going to do everything we can to, to keep, this, uh, keep this rolling. Oh, hey, i got plenty of time. Got a whole hour here to preach. Oh, I'm joking. I'm joking. I'm joking. No, I don't, I don't think I could handle that. I'd be wore out. No, it is an honor to be here, and God has blessed me throughout the years. Um, I, I'm not going to uh, tell you how many years I've been blessed to preach His Word uh, in this manner using the western rural heritage as my platform um, because it it really tell you how old i am um, but uh, it's been a blessing it's been uh, 20 plus years that god's blessed me with being able to use horses horsemanship um, western heritage rural america to be able to spread his word because reality is is there's a platform for every one of us and um, your platform is going to be totally different than my platform um, and because you've got a you've got a place where you can bless lives where you can touch lives And so that's just the difference. That's just life. That's just reality And so I've been blessed to uh, to be doing this for a, a little while just a couple years here and there um, But uh, for today, I, I'm just going to jump right in here because there is I've got uh, a lot of that's uh, God put on my heart for today um, and uh, if I was to put a title on this, this is a great title. This is a really good, feel-good title, all right? Are you ready for this? Are you ready for this? It's a really, this is awesome, feel-good title. The Life You've Always Wanted. <laughs> That's really, that makes you really excited. It's like, man, I came to church to find out how to live the life I've always wanted. Yeah. I'm going to put a little sub subtitle on that, how we can live, truly live, wild and free, because reality is, is, um, is, as we've already sang about today, and as we've already um, been talking to God about today, is the, you know, we, were, we were dead to sin. We were slaves to sin. And, you know, God says, you know what, I come to give you life, and life more abundantly. That's freedom, guys. That's, that's freedom. That's his freedom. We're, we're not slaves to a religion. We're not slaves to, to uh, rules and regulations. We are free to live the life of Christ. That's, the, that's what Christ has given to us. He, didn't, he, he brought us a new covenant, a new, something new, something fresh, something that wasn't uh, chains to bind us up. And so today we're going to look at um, living this, this life we've always wanted, living wild and free. And we're going to be looking at Acts chapter 10. And we're really going to, I'm not going to go through, because it takes way too much time for me to read every word of the text that I have for today. So you can just kind of follow along and hold me accountable. How's that? All right. So this is just kind of how I do things. We're going to be in Acts chapter 10, and we're also going to be in Judges chapter 7. So we're going to be looking at some transition here. We're going to be looking at some things. And, um, you know, in life, there, for all of us, not just for the first century church in Acts chapter 10 or Gideon in Judges chapter 7, but in all of our lives, there are times when we get to moving in a direction, and guess what? We need to have a perspective change. We have to have, we need an adjustment. 
I call them my God spankings, you know, because I get, you know, I'm just honest, guys. This is me. Uh, so sometimes I have to have them. Sometimes God has to, you know, bend me over his knee and take the paddle after me and say, hey, dude, straighten up. I'm sure none of you as kids ever had, and none of you kids in here, I'm sure every, you guys have great kids. None of you ever has to have spankings or anything like that. But um, I did. My brothers would tell you I didn't get enough. But I, you know, I guess that's why God takes care of me now. But anyway, but we do, we have to have that change in perspective, you know, because things happen, you know. It, when, I'm just going to say it. Uh, has anybody here ever gotten yourself in trouble? Like made a decision and you, you're, you, it just, the consequences were trouble. as problems. And when you get in those problems and you get in that trouble, do you ever pray, Lord, please help me. Help me through this, God. I need help in this because, you know, it, this is horrible. But guess what? We made the problem. We be the problem. God, God didn't make the problem for us. We made the problem. And so many times God is sitting there answering our prayers, but not by fixing the problem, but by changing the perspective. And that's what we have to get to today is get to a point, and I want us to truly dig in and think about this and get to the point to where we can be honest with ourselves and say, maybe, maybe I'm the problem and I just need to allow God to change my perspective. Maybe I need to adjust myself a little bit to, so that I, so God can do his thing. So that's what we're going to look at. And before we go any farther, we're going to pray because reality is, is I'm just a guy up here uh, and, and I ain't nothing. And so we're going to pray and we're going to ask God to, uh, to speak to us today. Dear Lord, I thank you so much for the opportunity that we have to come and to open your word. And as we are, have already prayed today, we pray that your word would be that double-edged sword that would cut us, that would be living and active today. Come and speak right where we're at, right in our lives today. And God, I'm just going to tell you, Lord, I pray that you'd mess us up. I pray that the God that you come into our life and come into the depths of our heart and just turn us inside out so that we can see you moving in us. And as your word says, that we wouldn't just be hearers of your word, but God, we would be doers of your word today. God, we love you. We worship you. And again, Lord, speak to our hearts in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, so here we go. We're going to look into this um, a little bit. And um, I, I know that in, in life, there's a lot of times, there's a lot of things that happen in our life. And, um, you know, and, and we get to go and, and, and things just start moving. It just flows, right? Life sometimes just happens and things just flow and we don't realize where we're at. It's kind of like a, the, this, this pretty little ball faced bay. And um, this pretty little ball faced bay, she moved out real nice. That pretty little bald faced bay. But no matter how you worked her, on the fence she would always stay. Pushing her harder or stepping back and letting her move, nothing you could do would get her out of that groove. Then the Lord, He opened my eyes, and as I constantly reach for the worldly prize, as I'm running around this thing called life, it's a lot like a round pin. And I get to choose what I will do, run for myself or hook on to God and win. So as we keep moving around this, the round pin, as she kept moving around the round pin, though pretty she may be, I knew then and there, if I were to act like her, I could never truly be free. Lord, here and now I surrender my all, was what I began to pray. I don't want to run on my own and keep acting like this little bald faced bay. See, that's how it is. Life is, we think about life as a simple round pin for a second. I'm, I'm, I'm sorry guys, I'm a horse guy, so this is the way it's going to roll. But, um, and it doesn't matter whether I'm trying to get in position on this horse to get it to move in a round pin when I'm training a horse, or even for you cattle people, if you're sorting cattle or you're moving cattle, if you're not in the right position, you're just working against yourself. I mean, them old cows, they don't care. Um, they don't care. You're just this little old dude and you're always in the way. It's, that's just the way it is. It's the same way in life. When we make these, these decisions and we leave God out of our life, we get out of position to see what God really has for us. We're out of position to see the, the true freedom that God has for our lives. And so today, right now today, we're going to start looking at something. And we're going to see how that if we allow God to change our perspective, 
that we can now get into position to get the vision to catch the mission that feeds the determination to see God's destination. And that's where we're going to go today. And we're going to look at Acts chapter 10. We're going to see how God did this perspective change to get Peter in position so that he could see the vision that, that in order to catch the mission that fed the determination to reach God's destination. Not just for Cornelius, if we read in, in, in chapter 10 of Acts, we see that this is Cornelius. He was a, he was a, a Roman a centurion he was in this italian guard thing and i'm not going to go into that but uh he he loved the lord he loved god he gave generously and god blessed him sent an angel of the lord to him and said hey man you need to go you need to go look for peter and in because i've got something new for you i've got something great i've got freedom for you and so he god decided you know we're going to change the perspective of this guy that was looking for something new and then so what god does now is we he's coming now and, and as we look firstly into the perspective change moving peter into the position to be where god needed him to be what happens to peter well they're in joppa they're on this journey he gets to joppa and uh, peter they're hungry you know anybody ever here ever get hungry I've been smelling this food ever since I walked in. Starting to get hungry. It's a good way to keep the preacher short, is to have food going. But anyway, <laughs> but uh, so Peter, Peter's up. He's he's hungry and he goes up and he goes. In, the, the the scripture says that he went into a trance. And and why is in this trance? He sees a vision and the Lord drops this what looks like a sheet down before him. And um, and there's all these four legged animals. It says reptiles and birds and all these different things are on the sheet and it's dropping down before him. And and the 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 voice of the Lord says, "Get up, kill and eat." Well, then Peter says, "Oh no, Lord, I would never do. It. I would never eat anything that's unclean or impure. I would never do that." Then the voice, the voice of the Lord comes back. This is one of the great things I love about the Lord because this is how he talks to me all the time. He says, how dare you call something impure or unclean that I have made clean? And that's a lot of times what we do. We get in our mindset what we think is in our perspective, what we think should happen. And God's saying, how dare you try to make your plans? I'm just going to sit back and let you see how your plans really go. You know, and, and you, while your plans fall apart and you're sitting there whining and complaining and being a little, you know, he's saying, you know what? All you have to do is buck it up, buttercup, and, we'll, and I'll come in and we'll take care of this. But reality is, is we would rather sit and complain about where the, the problems that we made. And we'd rather pray, God, change my problem instead of changing my perspective and getting me in position. And that's what was happening here. And it's the same thing that was happening in, in Judges chapter 7 with Gideon. Gideon had this great army that was going against the Midianites. And uh, man, they was going to go. And, and, and God says, you know what, Gideon? I can't let this happen. I can't let this. Because if I let you go, and with this army that you have, you're going to go and you're going to defeat the Midianites. And, you know, the children of Israel are going to think that they did it because of their numbers. Because they're just these big, you know, they're just all that in a bag of chips. Okay, and so God said, I can't let you do that. So we're gonna have to weed this out a little bit, you know. So He says, All right, go tell your army that, and he's, that anybody who's afraid they can go home, you know. So of course, you know, they're man, they're menly men. So I'm not afraid. There's a few of them that said, Okay, we'll go home, but not not very many, you know, because there's God says, You know, that's still too many, still too many people. We need to change some more perspective here. We need to get in position to do what I want to do. And so God says, I'm going to change your perspective and move into some position here. I want you to send everybody down to the water. And if, if they cup the, the water up with their hand, they lap it like a dog, then we're going to keep those guys. But anybody who gets down on their knees and drinks out of it, they, they've got to go home. So what's happened is, is uh, so Gideon, you know, being Gideon, you know, he's a man of God. So he's got to do it. I really like Gideon. He's a pretty cool guy and um, one of those guys that really just trusts God. And uh, so he does it. And guess what? 300 guys. 300 guys going against the Midianites that filled up this entire valley. If we were to go in to read this, the number of the Midianites was just crazy. Um, and, but God had to change their perspective to get them into position to really have victory. And that's what we see there, um, both with Peter and changing his perspective on, you know, because... Up to this point, and I'm kind of, I, I don't want to get too uh, far ahead of myself here, but up to this point, the, the first century church, they were, still, they were still rolling on some rules, weren't they? 
They, they were still saying that they, he, we, the Gentiles couldn't possibly receive what God has for them because they're Gentiles. They're, they're uncircumcised. They, you know, these, they, they can't, they, there's nothing that they could do that, that would make it okay. That would, that would let God pour out his blessing and his spirit upon them. I'm like us. I mean, because we're special. Right? That's what, that's what Peter's, that's what, not just Peter, but the entire um, first century church up to that point was thinking that. And so God didn't just want to change Peter's perspective. He wanted to do something radical. And to do something radical, he had to have him in position to see the true vision. To see the true vision. You know, and, and people a lot of times would say, well, what's God's vision for my life? And was like, well, I don't know, that's kind of weird, you know. What's God's vision for my life? Uh, that, that's, a, that's a pretty deep question, right? Not really. <laughs> Not really. Because we know what we're supposed to do. We know we're supposed to love the Lord our God with all of our heart, all our soul, and all our might. We know that we're supposed to love our neighbor with, uh, as ourselves. So we know that if nothing else, I should have this vision of compassion that's bigger than, than anything. This vision of compassion, of being the hands and feet of Christ should be my, my focus. That should be the, you know, I always tell people, keep the main thing the main thing. And the main thing is that I need to be Jesus with skin on. That's the main thing. And so, when, it's not real difficult. You know, and yeah, there, there are some times, there's some of us that have giftings and talents that others don't. And you know, and your platform, like I said, is a different than my platform. And so, that's fine. That's fine. And that's where God puts detail to our vision. But we have to be in a right position to receive that vision. And that's what we see his changing here with Peter as he's on the, on the roof. And as we secondly, as again, as I've already said, being in the position to see the vision, to, to really see and feel the vision that God had. And up to this point, I'm going to read, oopsie, I said oopsie, <laughs> anyway. Uh, <laughs> yeah, sometimes we're we're gonna go to uh, to Matthew uh, chapter twenty eight, and this is this was what the vision that the disciples had at this point in in Acts up to uh, to this point in Acts chapter ten, and this is a great commission. We all know it, and I could read it to you, and I could quote it to you right here, but I want us to read this and and pay attention to something uh, for a second. And I wasn't smart enough to mark it in my Bible, so I'm, I'm getting there, guys. Uh, bear with me. Here we go. There we go. All right. So we're reading in Matthew chapter 28, verses 19 and 20. It says, Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the, the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, and teach them... To obey everything I have commanded you, and surely I am with you to the very end of the age. So what's it say to teach them here? Does it say to teach them about Jewish law? Does it say to teach them that they have to follow a set of rules that, that, the, that the Jewish law set before them? You know, circumcision, uncircumcision, all this other lovely other stuff, the Sabbath day, all this other stuff. No, it doesn't say that. He says... To teach them everything I have commanded you. And what was the main thing that God, that Jesus had commanded the, his entire ministry? Love. Compassion. Gratitude. Being human. <laughs> Not being religious. His entire ministry was about that. And so up to this point, they had a skewed idea of what the vision was. And so God was moving Peter into position to catch the true mission. The true mission. That there was nothing that was unclean. That his spirit could be poured out and his, his gift of salvation could be given to anyone. Anyone. And we see, that's what we, ha we see is happening here when, um, when God gives this little uh, spiritual spanking to, to Peter and says, don't be calling things unclean that, that I've made clean. Don't be calling things impure that I've made pure. It's not your business. It, it ain't your business to do that. It's not my business to judge. It ain't your business to judge. Man, I, I'm telling you, I have been blessed to do ministry in a lot of weird places, all right? Places that a lot of Christian folk would say, why are you preaching there? 
I was like, because that's where the folks gathered to be preached at. <laughs> that's, where they, that's where they gathered to hear the word of God. So that's where I preached. It doesn't matter. I pastored a cowboy church in Colorado for two years. We had church in the sale barn every week. And it wasn't a nice sale barn, guys. It wasn't an Oklahoma sale barn. <laughs> We're talking wooden bleachers. <laughs> and it, I mean, it was rough. But, you know, it was a place that we gathered and we had a great time in the presence of God. And God did great things there. And we had even, even greater services underneath shade trees out working cattle in the middle of nowhere. You know, it's just, just the way it was. Sunday morning wasn't always church uh, at, spent in a church building. A lot of times Sunday morning was, was spent out working cattle with somebody and, uh, it, and having, you know, 10, 15 guys out there uh, branding calves. And we'd sit down at lunch and we'd, we'd have a little devotion. We'd, uh, we'd learn about God while we was having lunch. And then we'd go to church Sunday night. Well, church, you know, sail barn. <laughs> anyway, but that, you know, the reality is, is so many times in our lives today, so many times in our world today, in our religious world, we have an idea, and it's man's idea. And God's saying, you know what? This, this is not my plan. This was your plan. My plan is that everyone would have the opportunity to come to the saving knowledge of Christ everyone even that guy that's sitting out on top of his cooler drinking whatever he's drinking while he's working cattle has the same opportunity to hear about Jesus and have him in his heart as the guy sitting on the front pew at church everyone and so that takes that change of perspective to get catch that true vision and that's what was happening here with Peter. And then, so he, he changed the, the, the perspective so he could get that vision. But now he's, he needs to, uh, to catch a hold of the mission. And when you catch a hold of a mission, man, when you, once you see the vision and you can catch a hold of the mission, man, sometimes it's like, bam, it's like right then and there. Because what happened here in chapter 10, what Cornelius' people showed up and said, hey, we're looking for Peter. There's a, some angel said that there's going to be Peter. He's going to be here. So where's he at? And so sure enough, Peter comes down. It doesn't say that he questioned them. It doesn't say that he sat and thought about it for a couple days. It says that they, he, he asked them to come inside. They told him what the angel of the Lord said to Cornelius. And they left the very next day. The very next day. When we look at, at Judges chapter 7 and with Gideon. Get the, after the Lord had the, the changed, you know, his, got him in position. The Lord says, you know what? I need to show you what the mission really is. And the Lord says, you're ready. Here I go again. The Lord says, you're ready to go and to take the Midianites. But if you're still afraid, let me send you over here. Why don't you go and listen to what they're saying down in the camp for the Midianites. What, what are they really saying down there? And then God sends him down there so he can catch a hold of the mission. Sends him down there and he hears about how the Midianites are scared to death. They're scared because the Lord is with the Israelites. The Lord is with the children of Israel. So they're scared. He's go they're going to come in. They're going to take them. They're going to just, just kill them all. And Gideon hears this. And he goes back to his men and he says, Guys, you know, th this, this could be touch and go because there's a lot of people down there. And you know, maybe we should wait till tomorrow and maybe we'll be better encouraged then. No, that's not what he said at all. It says that he went and he got his men together and they divided them up and they went and they did it. Bam. He didn't, he didn't just wait to the next day or the, the next opportune time. He went and he did it. Went and did it right then. And I, I'm going to tell you, no, no horse trainer that's worth his salt is going to, going to work a horse that's just working just right and say, well, I'll wait another day to swing my leg on that one. No, I mean, it just doesn't work that way. I've, I've told myself before I had a horse one time, I said, I'm not going to ride this horse for at least a week. I'm going to go in, I'm going to work it, I'm going to do some groundwork, I'm going to show my, my ability. And I get in there and this horse is just hooked on, it's just pretty, it's moving nice, it's coming to me. And I'm like, i I, I got to wait till the next day. And then later on that day, I'm, I'm out and I'm messing with the horse and it's just doing really good. I'm like, well, I'll put a saddle on it and just see how it goes. Put a saddle on it and, and it's just going really great. I mean, and this mare was pretty too. I mean, she looked even better with the saddle on than she looked without the saddle. And I'm like, well, I can't just not ride this horse because she's just doing so good. And so what I do, I, I'm just, okay. So I swing a leg that day, like a whole week and before I told myself I was going to. And it was perfect. It was great. It was great. 
until about a year later and that that marriage has come totally untrained and bucked me off pretty hard it was it was like the first time she ever bucked and she had everything all built up and ready to just kick me right in the tail landed me on the ground but it was one of those deals where I had a mission I everything was working and everything was falling together and I wasn't gonna wait another day that's what Peter did that's what uh, Gideon did and that's what we have to do when we catch God's vision we don't want to we don't need to wait another well I'll wait until the next time I come into contact with that person to reach out to him I'll wait until I'll, I'll call them another day or or I'll send them an, I'll send them, I'll send them a text another time I'm just not feeling it right now but the reality is is God saying right now here's the mission take it do it and when we're in position to have the vision and then we can truly catch that mission, then it feeds the determination. And it, I'm truly, it will feed the determination. And that's what happened with Peter. He was determined at that point. He got up, he went the very next day. He went the very next day. And when he gets there to Cornelius' place, he, talk, he, he just, he flats tells him, he's like, you know what, I had a little bit of reservation, but I came anyway. I didn't question, I just came anyway, I had a little bit of reservation. So what happens, well, after he tells him this, and he starts telling him about the, about the Lord, and tells him about what God did, and how Jesus died, and raised from the dead, and then the Spirit of the Lord comes, and just falls on everybody, and just all this great stuff starts happening, and then it says, Peter himself said, well, who's to say that these folks can't be baptized? You know, and then it says that the, that, the, uh, that the believers, that the Jews that were there, the circumcised believers, they couldn't believe that the Lord was doing what he was doing there. But Peter was determined at this point because he had the vision and he caught that mission. He, he didn't just catch it a little bit, he caught it big time. And then he was determined to see God do amazing things. And what happened after this point? What happened after that point? The church just exploded, did it not? All over the known world at that time. Same thing happened with Gideon. What happened? They go, he takes and he divides up. He had, and he was determined to make this happen. He, they didn't just go and attack the Midianites. The Midianites attacked themselves. If you don't know the story, this is pretty cool, okay? These guys were so afraid that when they followed through, when Gideon followed through with the plan and they broke the vessels and they had the, all these lights going around and they were shouting and blowing trumpets and all this stuff, the Midianites were so afraid they started killing each other. And the ones that didn't die, they ran off afraid. And so what did Gideon do? He's like, well, I guess we won. Is that all he did? No, he was pretty determined. He had the determination. He, they ran them down. The Bible says they hunted them down. Hunted them down. They were determined. They were determined to see God's destination. To see... Did I do that? That's the fire right there. Anyway... They were determined to see God's destination. And that's exactly what happened with Peter too and the first century church. After the Spirit started moving, after they saw that God was going to fall and His Spirit was going to fall on everybody and anybody, man, things exploded and they could see, they were determined to see God's destination reached. And they did. They did. We wouldn't have, we wouldn't be here today in, this, in a church today being able to worship God, being able to open his word if it wasn't for the determination to see God's destination. And I am here to tell you today that God's destination for you is going to look different than mine. It is. Because your life is your life. It's, I mean, you know what's going on in your life. You know, you know the platform that you have. You know where you're at. You know the problems that you've made for yourself. It's reality. It's reality because we all do it. Because we all make our own problems. We have to deal with the consequences of those problems. Sometimes God can, can reach in. And you know what's the old saying? That sometimes he calms the storm. Sometimes he calms the sailor. Something like that. I can't remember exactly what it says. But... That's the way it is. Sometimes we just have to ride the storm out. Sometimes the, the, the Bronx is going to buck, <laughs> and you just have to ride the buck. That's just the way it is. And you can either ride it out or you can bail out. And, you know, as, as far as I'm concerned, I'm going to ride it out. I'm going to grab a hold of a rain, and I'm going to yank it over, and I'm just going to let the thing go. 
The reality is, is your bronc is going to be different than my bronc. It's going to look different. And maybe it's something that you've created. And you're thinking to yourself, what, how do I get to this destination? How do I get to God's destination in my life? Because, you know, that's, wouldn't that be great if a preacher could come up here and say, this is how you do it. If I could do that, I'd be a rich man. I'd be a rich man. Really would. I'd sell that. I'd bottle it up and I'd sell it. I sure would. Who wouldn't? But the reality is, is it's, it's not that simple. It's not that simple. And I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to read, I'm going to, well, yeah, I'll read it just because I said I was going to. I'm going to read a scripture that everybody knows, I'm sure. Most everybody knows this scripture because it's very, very familiar. In Proverbs chapter 3, verses 5 and 6. How do, I, how do we reach that destination? And again, it's going to, am I doing that? My goodness, I've been doing that. Is that? Oh, great. Been doing it the whole time. Now I ask now when I'm done. <laughs> anyway, how do we get to that destination? Proverbs 3, verses 5 and 6. It says, trust in the Lord with all your heart. Trust in the Lord with all your heart. Lean not on your understanding. Don't lean on what you think you know. Don't lean on what you might have an idea of. Lean not on your own understanding. But in all your ways, submit to him. All your ways, submit to him. Then he'll make your path straight. Then he'll lead you right to his destination. I said, well, that's pretty simple, right? A whole lot easier to read that scripture than it is to live it, isn't it? Trust in the Lord with all your heart. Where's your trust at today? Is your trust in that job? Is your trust in that person? I mean, I, I've been blessed over the years to work with, uh, um, I, I noticed as I was driving in that you guys have a Celebrate Recovery here. I've been blessed to work with Celebrate Recovery and also uh, a different version of the same type of ministry. And we do a lot of work with different people who put their trusts in different things, wrong things. And it's not always chemical. It's not. Codependency is a, a new buzzword. It's not new. It's reality is it's been around forever. But, uh, you know, what's that doing? What am I doing when I do that? What am I, I'm putting my trust in a person. I'm making a person God instead of letting God be God. It could be anything. I, I don't know where your trust is at. I don't know where your situation is. But reality is, is we have to allow God to change our perspective so that we can learn how to trust him and lean on him. When we lean on him, that's when we start to get in that right position. We can get in the position to see the vision and catch the mission that will feed the determination to stay on that path to reach his destination. That's what we have to have. And church, I'm telling you, there is a, there is a community here, there is a county here, there's a region here that doesn't need to hear more religion. They don't need to hear more stuff. They don't need to hear more doctrine. They need to hear scripture and truth. They need, to, they need to hear us keeping the main thing the main thing. And the reality is, is that the only way some of these people are going to hear God's word, the only way that they're going to really reach the freedom and the life that we want to have, that we want to share, the only way they're going to hear it is from you. By seeing you or by hearing it from you. And how can we do that? How can we do that if we're not living it? How can, how can we show that if I'm not living that every day? So what I want us to do right now is, is uh, maybe it's a little bit different. Maybe it's not something you're used to. I don't know. But, um, but I know for me, I'm a very vis visual person. I, and things, I, I, do, I, have to, I have to almost feel things physically, you know, and see things right here, you know, tangible. And so when, I, what I would like for is if you'll stand with me today. And if you didn't know it, I've been closing for the last like 15, 20 minutes, so. <laughs> but what I, what, what I want us to do at this point right now is I want us to, to just to sit and think and just to be honest with ourselves. And, and if you want to come and find a place, I, man, Pastor, I love you bringing, opening your altars to your people because this is where life's going to be changed. And your altar doesn't have to be up here. Your altar can be in your pickup. 
Those of you that have to go check cattle, I mean, there's a lot of times I spend time just talking to God when I'm in a barn, okay? That's my altar. Maybe I'm riding a horse. That's my altar. It doesn't matter where you are, but what I want us to do right now, and, if, and like I said, if you want to come to the altars and just kind of be honest with yourselves, I want you to truly allow God to, you remember, did you really listen to my prayer when I said God mess us up? Yeah, I, I meant that, by the way. Okay? And maybe we need to come and find a place to, to just be honest with God and say, God mess me up. I want to trust in you, but I can't do it until I get rid of my perspective. I want to trust in you, but I can't do it until I clean this junk out. I want to be in position. I want to see your vision. I want to, I want to have that mission. I want to be passionate about it again, God. But sometimes there's things that get in the way. Psalm 51, the re psalm of repentance. Create in me a clean heart, O God. Renew a steadfast spirit within me. Renew a steadfast spirit within me. Cast me not away from your presence. Take not your Holy Spirit from me, but renew unto me the joy of my salvation. Today, God, we come to this place, and as your word has spoke to our hearts, as we come to this place, if we, as we've allowed you to truly come and speak into us, I pray right now that you would open the eyes of our hearts all over this room. I pray that you would purify our hearts today, God. Your word says that blessed are the pure at heart, for they shall see the face of God. Today, God, I pray that you would purify our hearts so that we can see you right where you need us to be today. Right now, in this very moment. I pray that you would allow us to be honest with ourselves. To truly be honest with ourselves. Right now, I... I'm sorry, I'm kind of blunt, so if everybody open your eyes and look around. No, I'm, don't look around, just open your eyes, look up here. If you're here today and you say, you know what, I'm out of position. I need my perspective changed. I'm out of position and I need, I need to get my perspective right. I need to trust in the Lord with all my heart and I need to get moved to where I can. If that's you today, I'm, gonna, I'm just going to ask you, I'm just going to tell you, just be really blunt with you. Keeping it secret's not helping. Because all that, all's, all's that secretive stuff does is create more, dis, more distance between you and God. So I'm going to tell you today. <laughs> Come on, buttercup. If that's you, and, and you say, you know what, I, I need to change my perspective, I want you to raise your hand. Nobody's looking around. Nobody's, nobody's good judging you. I'm definitely not. You can put your hands down. There's hands all over the place, church. And right now what I want us to do is I want us to take time, and I want you, those of you who raise your hands, I want you to take time right now as I'm talking. Don't just stop listening to me, okay? Close your eyes and start talking to God. Close your eyes and start surrendering to God right where you're at. Right where you're at. Just start talking to God. And just tell him. And, and just say, God, right now, I want to surrender to you. Right now, I want to trust in you. But I don't know where to go. I don't know what's next. I have fear in my heart. I have all these questions, and I just don't know. God, just tell him. Just be honest with him. Say, God, I want to surrender, but I just don't know. I need I need your peace to come in and, and put calm to my anxiety. Philippians chapter 4 says, Be anxious about nothing, but in all things bring your, bring your prayer, bring your needs to the Lord with thanksgiving, and He will give you the peace that surpasses all understanding. So right now, where you're at, just start doing that. Just start doing that. Start bringing those needs. Just start bringing that fear, that unknown that has been keeping you from being in position with God that's got your perspective out of whack. Just start, just start talking to God about that. And with everybody's heads bowed and as, we're, as you're praying, I want you just to continue to pray. And if you're here and you say, you know what? I want to just know Jesus. 
I want this freedom and I haven't had that chance yet. If that's you here, I want everybody in this place to do this with me. And, and Pastor, I hope I'm not stepping over my bounds, but I want everybody in this place to repeat this prayer. Dear Lord, I come before you today knowing that I'm a knucklehead. Knowing that I don't always get it right, even though I try. I've messed up. I've sinned. And I'm asking you right now to forgive me. I repent. I turn away from that sin. And I surrender to you. I confess with my mouth that Jesus Christ is Lord. And that God raised him from the dead. I believe it in my heart. And from this day on, I want to live for you. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Church, that's what it's all about. That's what it's all about. And you know what Scripture says? Scripture says if just one person said that prayer for the first time, if just one person said that and they meant it from the depths of their heart, not just one or two angels are rejoicing, but an, the entire multitude of heaven is rejoicing right now because of that. And I think it's something that we as a church need to be get excited about once and again. And I think it's something that we need to be passionate about. And Pastor, I'm sorry, I know this is something that you probably should be telling your people, but people, we need to be passionate about the lost. We need to be passionate about seeing people come to the Lord and we get excited when they do it. And so right now I want to leave you with that challenge. Let's get into position. Let's trust in the Lord and be, stay in that position. And let's catch that vision. Let's just keep the vision, catch the mission so we can feed that determination and we can get to God's destination. Thank you very much.